read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance Hey, lady listeners, this is a special week at Read Me Romance, and it's, and it's kind of funny, too. <laughs> I have a special guest today. I have Ruby Dixon on with me, and you are going to get a preview of Bull Moon Rising that's live today. And I, you know what? It's funny, too. I'm not sure how to introduce you, and I'm like, hey, this is Ruby Dixon. Um, Hi. she's an author. <laughs> right? <Hi. I> know. <laughs> I'm like, it's it's totally fine. We've been talking for like 30 minutes before this, but you know, yeah, I'm like, okay, so we met like 10 years ago. You and I did. Yeah, and something like that. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. And you know, I we talk all the time. We talk every day. I think that's the thing too, is that the problem is you and I will talk a lot about a lot of stuff and I'm then I'm like, like like this isn't like <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I know right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well we were talking before before I hit record and I was like okay so I'm gonna put on my I'm gonna put on my headphones I'm gonna switch to my microphone and you're like oh shit it just got real <laughs> like like oh fuck this is it <laughs> yeah I don't this is like the first podcast I've done is Ruby and I have a horrible fear of public speaking mm -hmm. so like yeah. Like normally when we talk, I'm fine. But when mm -hmm. we're like, oh, no, this is going to be for the podcast. I'm like, mm. but, <laughs> no. um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if I interrupt you, I'm sorry, because that's what I do when I get nervous. I think it's a anxiety thing. So no, we that's our thing, though. OK, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> anxiety. That's our thing. <laughs> yeah. Anxiety. Survivor. Yes. Great British baking mm -hmm. show. Talking sure. over to each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Cats. Being like, oh, wait. Yeah, cats for sure. That was another thing where I was like, it's okay if there's, you know, if you guys hear a background noise of like paper rustling, it's, you know, Ruby's new kitten in the background who Bean. is, yeah, yeah, little Bean who is enjoying life. Oh my God. She is such a freaking cutie. She is. She slept with me all last night. So she you have true lady bliss. <laughs> Did you? I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's how it goes. <laughs> when yeah. you have a cat on you, you're like, I don't want to disturb her sleep. <laughs> that's right. And it's like yeah. if, they, if I ever moved, she would like meow at me because she's very whiny. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she's a chatty girl. She is. They say that's mm -hmm. a tortitude, but I've never had a tortoise shell. And I was like, oh, that's, that's crap, whatever. No, yeah, she's, yeah. she's extremely vocal. So that's like, what I've heard is like those tortoise cats, I guess, like the, they're like tan and brown. Is that tan and brown and white or? So I think tortoise shell is that it's the mixture of uh, colors without the white on it. Oh, um, like a calico. White, it's a calico, right? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, because well, um, both tortoise shells and calicos are like ninety nine point ninety nine percent of the time girls. So mm -hmm. that's what I've heard that about. Like um, that kind of same ratio with like orange cats too. That they're almost always boys. It's rare mm -hmm. to have a girl. That's one. What? I was I like, a, that's weird. I had a girl orange cat. Uh, speaking of, <laughs> <laughs> look at that segue. We didn't even fucking mean to do. I'm like, we could yeah. totally have a podcast about cats. No, <laughs> that's not about it. Write that down. Lady listeners somewhere, write that down. Okay. Ruby and I are going to have a podcast about cats. But, um, okay. So just to, just to get down to it real quick. So you're going to get played a preview of Bull Moon Rising that's live today, but I really wanted to talk to Ruby about this book because I read it and I was so fucking obsessed with it. I read it all in one day, the entire book. Wow. And you know, that's such a big thing for me in general, just to read an ebook because, you know, I'm dyslexic and ADD. So I'm, constantly putting my book down and getting up or whatever but I could not stop reading with this one and so when I asked you about being able to play a part of the audio you're like yeah and then we were like well let's just talk and I was like that's even better so um well, for having me of course absolutely I'll so I'm gonna best guest ever yeah no, I, no, no. I was gonna say like who are you competing with but right yeah I'm number one <laughs> uh -huh. yeah absolutely so it was fun to like kind of do something a little different for the podcast and give people a chance to hear this book but um I'm gonna read your author bio so oh, okay <laughs> 
It says, Ruby Dixon loves to write outlandishly fun romance. Right now, she's obsessed with monster heroes. She also dabbles in bikers, bears, and aliens have her hearts. You know her from the TikTok sensation, Ice Planet Barbarians. She requires coffee to function and will show you pictures of her cats in a moment's notice. You have been warned. It's all true. It's all, all true. true. I love it. Yeah. Um, I wrote down some of the tropes that I thought were in this book as I was reading it. Um, okay. In Bull Moon Rising, I wrote down Marriage of Convenience. Yes. Um, enemies to Lovers. I think it might have a little bit of that. Yeah, I, I mean, they're more like opposing sides. Oh, that's a good one. That's a that's a good way to put it because they don't really have animosity towards each other. It's almost like they're just stuck in this situation. They're exasperated with each other more than anything. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I really, I always, I'm like, yes, I'm going to write enemies to lovers. And then I just mm -hmm. have a really hard time when they both like despise each other. Yeah, Because yeah. I feel like there has to be that foundation of like, friendship at some point and yeah. it's really hard to go from that or else the book would have been like 500,000 words long because yeah <laughs> I, I would need time to work through it so. well and to like redeem him and to or, or to me I'm always thinking about the guy being an asshole I'm never really thinking about the girl because I'm like she can do whatever she wants like right. they're just yeah they're just untouchable but with the hero I just hold them to a higher standard so, like, if he, for me especially, it's hard to, like, it has to be a really, it has to be written really well, like, an enemies to lovers, you know? I always think of, like, like, back in the day, like, somebody mm -hmm. that I hated mm -hmm. as, as, like, a guy, you know, like, like, mm -hmm. there was a guy, like, uh, when I was in college that used to call me Boobzilla or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, what would it take for me to take him off of the... Oh, fuck this guy shit. Just to, I want to fuck this guy. You and just like, blew my fucking mind with that thought. With that would, thought really alone. That would, because, like, holy shit, yeah. It would take an act of God. Yes. And so, like, that's why I have to have them be at least a little friendly mm -hmm. and, like, on opposing sides. Like, you can be, like, opposite sides of whatever stance you're taking and mm -hmm. still have a common ground. But, like, if I hate your ass, maybe this is me. I don't want anything to do with you. I certainly don't find you sexy. Yeah, I like yeah. Spit on your grave. You yeah. Know? I like when it's somebody, like, especially in a trusting, loving relationship and somebody's, like, done you wrong. Or if it's, yes. you know, even if you're in a situation where you feel slighted by that person and they were vindictive in that slight, like, that, that would just be so impossible to come back from that. It's so, a different person than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, other things that, you know, that are in this sort of tropes, found family, um, you know, the, the, the group of ragtag friends that are around them. Love that. Um, love too. That's like one of my favorites to write. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Just a, a group that bands together. They're all scrappy. <laughs> I, I like to think of them all as like characters just waiting for their own story. And then mm -hmm. my brain is like, well, here's how the story goes. And then yeah, like, I'll yeah, stop piling people for future uh, future releases. <laughs> I love that. Um, there's also nodding in this one, which I feel like, I mean, that should get its own highlight on there. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder if maybe there's a little bit of a breeding kink in there too. I'm just saying I mean, that it wasn't not in there. It, not, it keeps not showing not. up in my books for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not deliberately like setting out to do it, but it's to repopulate a planet. What? <laughs> yeah, it might be. Um, oh, what's the word? Uh, I don't remember. Words are hard. I've only had one cup of coffee. Um, mm -hmm. like, so like, not psychological. I hope you're cutting this part out. <laughs> no, I'm leaving it all in because I'm be like, listen to what a dumbass she is. <laughs> <laughs> like, you Art. think she's fake? Oh. You think she's amazing? Listen to this. <laughs> okay, you know when like like it's biological, unintentional. It's like a subliminal. Oh, yeah. oh subliminal. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Okay. So you're putting reading in them. Now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not the last five minutes. So. Uh, no, never, <laughs> never. All right, we're gonna go into questions now because I have lots. Um, so. 
Well, let me start with this. So you're going to hear like an audio clip in a little bit. And I think it's a great intro to the story because it's not like the opening scene because there's a lot that gets established at first, especially with the heroine Aspeth. And you find out kind of like what she's on an adventure. Like, why is she on this adventure? And so when you open the book and you read the first page, I think that's kind of where you start is on her adventure. So I actually asked the publisher for this little clip that was a little bit further in because it showed such a great tension between the hero and the heroine and why they're kind of on this journey and why they need each other. And so you're going to hear that a little bit, but before that, I thought maybe um, like we could talk about sort of how to preface this story. And so like what inspired it and where it came from. So, but Um, yeah, what it, Okay, I'll go. One no. of my first questions. No, no, I'll go. You shut up. <laughs> <It> is- <laughs> oh, no, no. I was going to say, I, ha- I sent a list of questions so you would know what I was going to ask. And I'm already like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I, I looked at it very briefly and I was like, I'm smart enough to compose answers in advance. So we're like, just- these, you want to just wing it. This is great. Yeah. But no, um, you mentioned in um in writing this that you spoke about the Royal Geographical Society, which I have no idea what this is. So, okay. Um, I read The Lost City of Z and I forget mm-hmm. the name of the author, but it was all about like this um explorer in like the turn of the century, 19th century, um, mm-hmm. Percy Fawcett. And Percy Fawcett was part of the Royal Geographical Society in the UK. And I was like, I'd never heard of this either. It yeah. was like a society of like um rich people, basically. Because uh-huh. rich people yeah, are yeah. the ones that have all the free time. Um mm-hmm. that would get together <laughs> and they would discuss like uncharted places they would go on these expeditions mm-hmm. they would talk about places they'd been they'd map stuff i mean and they had like these rule books of like okay if you go to this place here is how a royal geographic society person should conduct themselves and it was just like to me it was like this really cool club of mm-hmm. like explorers trying to hit the last places on earth that have not yet been explored that's fascinating. I thought that was the coolest. And I read some yeah. books on like, they would go to the Arctic, they would go mm-hmm. um, to the Amazon, anywhere that they were like, this place needs to be mapped. They mm-hmm. would go and um, somebody would always sponsor the trip because again, rich people, mm-hmm. but it was really, really interesting. And there was like only like one or two women in like a hundred years that were like, members of renown in this particular um society i'm One shocked was named- I'm yeah shocked. exactly <laughs> ella bird mm-hmm. and um she wrote like books about it but i thought it was really interesting that like she's this one woman trying to hold her own amongst all of these you know guy scholars and i can only imagine how they talk to her and i think that was mm-hmm. kind of like um the thread of the story like well what if we did this in a in a fantasy society Mm -hmm. change the rules a bit more and um like how they treat her when she goes in and she's like yes i would like to be part of your club and And they're they're all like just laugh her out of there yes that i'm telling you reading those different scenes in the book where aspeth the heroine where she just wants to get in this group and she wants to be a part of it and she's read every single thing she can and she knows everything about it and she's so fucking smart and capable and worthy and they're just laughing in her face it's like i was enraged it parts of this reading it because I was like these people need their comeuppance you know like there better be some like and it was so satisfying the end of oh my god it was so good so <laughs> not to spoil anything Thank it's you. really good yeah. not to spoil but the ending's awesome <laughs> I mean yeah. I think there isn't a woman out there that mm-hmm. hasn't like had a job where people talk down to you yep. or treat you like you were a dummy just because you're a woman mm-hmm. and like it's easy to draw on that. <laughs> I know. I'm telling you, I think that's why, like, I immediately connected with her on this level of, like, oh, she's not being taken seriously. Because yeah. there because there are so many instances in, I'm sure, every woman's life, like you say, that you can pull from and be like, yep, I've met that fucker. 
Like yeah. the one you write in this book, like who she, you know, who Aspeth meets and gets laughed at. It's like, I immediately knew who that was in my life with my experiences yeah. to draw on. So, yeah, I just, I really loved how that sort of like endeared you to her in a way mm -hmm. that maybe wouldn't have happened had she, had she just been like this rich king's daughter, you know, like it wouldn't have been as relatable as so, you know, Aspeth is going on this mission to basically find buried treasure. So just to make it like as basic as possible. So her, she lives in kind of a kingdom or at least this is how I interpreted it. Let uh -huh. me tell you what I think about this. <laughs> let me, let me, I was gonna say, let me mansplain your book to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so my interpretation, I was reading it is so there's a, there's a different kingdoms and, um, that hold all these really valuable treasures that are magical that they dig up from the ground or whatever. And Aspeth's father has gambled all of his treasures away. So their kingdom is destitute, but nobody knows this yet. So it's been right. like kept a secret. So she's going on this adventure to join, to join this Royal artifact society in order to collect these like magical objects and send them back to her kingdom to save them so that you know the people there have money and that kind of thing so yeah is that yes. okay like, all right I got it. nobody <laughs> knows that like they are broke and mm -hmm. a lot of the artifacts that the nobles collect because only nobles are supposed to um have access to these artifacts because mm -hmm. basically it's the the wealthy holding down the common people yes yes a couple of things in here didn't even uh -huh, think yeah it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, so they would use like these magical artifacts to um, defend their little city state holds. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you if your neighboring hold finds out that you don't have anything, mm -hmm. well, they can just sweep in and take you. And like, you know, I guess like it's the whole money talks thing. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a king. But what's he going to do if, you know, you took this keep and, like, killed everyone inside and, like, suddenly now it's yours, you know, he'll be like, yeah. okay, pay, pay a penalty and don't do that shit again. And that's literally. <laughs> what that's yeah, about. yeah. So to me, it, it was like, okay, you know, it's not just Aspeth trying to um, save her own skin. It's her mm -hmm. trying to save, like, her father and all the people in the hold because she. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's the only one that knows about this problem. She can't go tell everybody, oh, guess what? You know, we yeah. have problems. I'm sorry if you hear the paper back there. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That, Your that kids are playing with some packing paper. She's having a good time. She is having the best time. So, but yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I wanted it to be more than, because like, you could write a story about like, yeah, she's, you know, she's a rich girl and she wants to mm -hmm. go play the club with the boys and there's not the stakes there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's always like, how can I make this situation worse? <laughs> <laughs> I think you kind of mentally yeah. yeah. But in making it worse, you made it so much more relatable that she's trying to do the right thing by saving her people. And yet she's, you know, she's faced with so much misogyny that stands in her way. Yeah. So another way that you related this story to kind of like, you know, something more concrete, because this is a romanticy, you know, and we'll get into the, that element in just a second. But like the way I like that you related it was the Sherpas that take people up Mount Everest, where it's like, you know, you get these rich dudes that are like, I climbed Everest, look at me. And meanwhile, the Sherpas in the background, like, this is my fourth time today, buddy. Let's go. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I just thought about like, it's a lot of it is the, um, the common people that do all the work and then the rich guy mm -hmm. swoops in and takes all the credit. Yeah. And so I loved how that moved into the, the fantasy side of this romanticy where we come in and we meet Hawk, who is a minotaur. Yes. And he's kind of part of the gang that has to go down. He basically leads the groups that go down and retrieve these treasures for all the rich dudes that are like, hey, look what I did. You know, and he's the workhorse, for lack of a better phrase, he's, I guess. He's the muscle. He's the one that mm -hmm. actually gets the job done because um, in the guild, there's a lot of like, you know, who who are your, what are your rich people like? Well, they're spoiled and mm -hmm. they are not necessarily like physically adept. 
And so the guild has a problem where they are getting a lot of these spoiled rich boys that go down there and they're like, oh, I'm going to find all the artifacts. And they have to get saved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go in and retrieve them because they get lost or they do something mm -hmm. stupid. And and there's cave-ins and then Hawk has to come down and move, you know, thousands of pounds of boulders to get these yeah. dummies out. It always falls to the Torians who are the mm -hmm. ones who do all the, the hard work. Yeah. Because you know, um, I thought like the perfect sort of monster for being in tunnels mm -hmm. and like knowing their way around would be a minotaur because it yeah. kind of falls back to the myth. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, you know, the Torians have um, good eyesight. They can like smell really well, smell really well. They smell really <laughs> good. Um, they have a good smeller. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. And, they're very strong and they have a lot of stamina so they can like get the job done, but you still have like the, the humans in charge because, mm -hmm. um, because they're the ones with all the money. Bean, what are you doing up there? <laughs> no, she's just like chilling out with you. It's so cute. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how she got up here. Okay. We'll take her down just in case. <laughs> she's, she's just going to get right back up there. So, yeah. It's okay. I'm going to mark that down so we can take it out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 not at all. I'm glad I get to see her. Um, so there's a progression of time in the book that refers to the Conquest Moon. And this applies to Hawk, the hero. So the Conquest Moon happens, is it every five years? Is that right? Every five You're, years, yeah. Okay, so every five years, there's this big moon that comes and it basically sends all Torians. Is that, am I saying that right? Torians? Yeah, that's how I said it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I'm reading it, it's different when I listen into the audio because in the audio, I get all pronunciations. So I don't have to worry about that. When I'm reading it, I just got to guess. But so <laughs> during the conquest moon, all the Torians go into basically like this rut. And it was like this heat that's on them and they have to, they go crazy. It's like a frenzy. So it's leading up to the conquest moon, the beginning of this book, and you go through it. And one really cool fact is if you get the paperback or if you get the ebook as well, the chapter headers, the moon changes as the book progresses and the moon gets fuller and fuller as it goes. And I didn't realize that the first time I read it until I saw it in the paperback and you were talking about it. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit. And I had to go back in my ebook and I was like, I'll be goddamn. The moon changes every fucking chapter or like every couple of chapters as time progresses, it goes forward. Yeah. So. I mean, Berkeley was like really great. To oh work my with God. On it. Because I was like, okay, the moon tip phases have to be in there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I really want a, a really like, like fun cover. And oh, holy a, shit. Like, yes. You know, and it is. paper and like, I want it to be like super tricked out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's art on, the, there's like colored art on the inside. The chapter headers are gorgeous. The sprayed edges on it. The cover is like violent pink like it is <laughs> ridiculous uh it's sparkly it's pink i'm like that literally could not have envisioned looks, a more perfect cover it looks like lisa frank vomited on it which yes. is awesome the yeah. interior paper is done by i even got like the artists that i wanted um is oh done by lilith Sor, who does mm -hmm. the ally hazelwood covers oh and I was yeah like, her do some art she's fantastic and i I'm love all those her, i do not know her gender i'm assuming so if that is incorrect that is upon me oh okay um, okay and uh the cover is the same one that does like the um ice planet barbarians covers i want to say her name is kelly wagner so well it's I, gorgeous I let me let me look at this for like <laughs> I'm just, I'm super stoked about it because of all the little things like that that are in it that I didn't even catch the first time I read it. That I'm so excited to like reread and see all these other little parts of it, especially in the paperback. It's you just, you should absolutely read it at least five or six times and buy copies of <laughs> friends. So. Just saying. I mean, you're saying that like I won't. I'm about to hear this audio and I'm going to be like, yes. <laughs> and the audio is going to be the the duet narration. I don't know that it's, okay. uh, I know it's a, the male narrator doing the hero's voice and mm -hmm. the, the female narrator doing the heroine's voice. Mm -hmm. I don't think they switch off for all like the super minor characters. Oh, yeah. For like side characters and stuff. Right. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. Which, mm -hmm. Because they were like, 
they're like, this is a really long book. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah. I can't imagine having to do that for the entire thing. But no, the the narrators are on there fantastic. But I was going to say about the the moon phases that change on it, like going back and seeing that was so mm-hmm. cool. But it's also it that changes as the story progress because it's really what's driving the story. Because as we go in it, Hawk is running out of time because once this happens, he's kind of kind of crazy. So um, and, and this is also included in the audio clip that you're about to hear today. Um, the whole reason, you know, they sort of have this marriage of convenience is because she wants to get into this guild and she can't because she needs a sponsor. She needs a man to sponsor her so she can do this. She's a chaperone. Yep. And he needs something to fuck. (laughs) So I'm like, what better reason? Yeah. He's definitely more of a, um, a demisexual hero where he, he is, he will use, you know, um, sex workers if he has to, but it really like does not sit well with him. Yeah. So, yeah. Like his mm-hmm. buddy's like, just, you know, get a woman, get a man, whatever, mm-hmm. just, you know, get somebody, spend a couple of days in there. You'll be great. And he's mm-hmm. like, that doesn't sit well with me. So the thing with, um, Hawk yeah. is like, okay, well, if I marry Aspeth, um, we have a month to get to know each other. And I yeah, have somebody yeah. that, uh, I'm familiar with, I'm comfortable with to mm-hmm. go through this. So, yeah. I did think it was fun that like as the book progresses towards the um, conquest moon, he gets moodier. Mm-hmm. Yep. Having his period. <laughs> so like he gets difficult to reason with and they're all like, you know, kind of. Isn't like, writing romance the best? Cause you really get to get back at men. <laughs> Honestly, it was so much fun. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was massive r- craving for chocolate at some yeah, point. The cramps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. No, that was I think that was something I really loved reading was like kind of how he does get like crabbier and like more temperamental. So as he gets closer to it, you can just tell he's so on edge, you know, about everything. But yeah. I just loved how that gave so much anticipation to the story and yeah. their connection grew. Um, did you have like a favorite moment in the book that you wrote? Like as you, and then sometimes I can look back at a story and remember moments really fondly, like, oh my God, I really love them together in that moment. I was just wondering if there was something that stuck out with you with Bull Moon, if there was a particular moment. Well, now I feel like I have to say yes. <laughs> no, I mean, no, you, you're like, no, everything was my favorite. <laughs> well, I mean, I really liked them interacting. Like I really liked when he's like, um, not to be a spoiler, but like they're in bed together and like, he's like mansplaining to her what things are, what's going to happen mm-hmm. when, you know, when he goes into rut and she's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, yes. I loved you. that. I love that. Cause she's like half asleep and she's like, yeah. sure. Okay. I got it. <laughs> like, I like this, that she's like, not, he feels like she's not taking things seriously and she's like, mm-hmm. no, it's not a big deal, whatever. So, mm-hmm. um, I liked, <laughs> Like setting up flaws for characters. Like when you go through the story, like Aspeth, because who's a heroine, mm-hmm. um, because she has grown up sheltered, she reads books, she sits in her little, you know, safe library, and um, that's all she does. She is very sheltered when it comes to like real life. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so, yeah. like, you see her saying stuff and doing stuff, and you're like, you dummy you know yeah. mm-hmm. and uh she makes those choices that's fun that's fun mm-hmm. to be like yeah i know this character's doing a terrible job at making these decisions but that's part yeah. of the fun of it and like mm-hmm. with hawk it was uh fun to stack things like like him getting moody or like um mm-hmm. he has a fear of something in particular that i don't <laughs> worry it's, it's and, adorable uh, yeah mm-hmm. it's just like you know just adding the little bits there was a lot of fun for me. Oh my God. Those are like the chocolate chips and a cookie for me. Like those little moments that you're talking about that, those are the best things when I, I feel like that endears me to a character. It Uh connects me to them in a real way and it makes them memorable. Like, you know, even us talking about these little things that you're pointing out, the flaws or like Uh the imperfections or the silliness to it. 
Right. You know, it, it's one right. of the reasons I love romance, but it's one of the reasons I love this story because there's so many of those chocolate chips through it. Yeah. That I just like, was like, if oh, you're going to write these characters, like give them a lot of like, mm -hmm. like small problems. It doesn't have to be a big problem. Like one of the most fun characters that I wrote in like Ice Planet Barbarians was um, the hero Herrick. And he was also, um, he was kind of a jokester, but like he would faint at the side of his own blood. <laughs> and it's like that yeah. was so much fun because uh -huh. she's like, oh, he's fainted again, and she didn't yeah. come up and haul him back home. Uh -huh. yeah. He would see like a drop of blood on his finger, just like something like you can be like, yeah, yeah, this is absolutely ridiculous. We have to laugh at it. But that's yeah. why it's. But it makes it, uh, it makes it so much sweeter when that happens because it just yeah. it's relatable and endearing and loving. And I just, uh, those are the bits I live for. I, I love, love that. that moment so mm -hmm. me too me too um found family is something that we see a lot of in the story and we talked about you know that being one of the tropes and stuff yeah. um how do you think that resonates pun intended <laughs> <laughs> with readers like having the found family aspect of it i think readers actually like when they read my books they look for something like that like when i write like the rizda verse books they're like now let's see if we can run it if, let's see if we'll run into this character in this story that yeah. um showed up you know a million books ago Mm -hmm. um because they're in the same area and everything i try to write like is connected in some way not everything i mean like but um i do like those easter eggs of characters showing up mm -hmm. and so like it does feel like you know everybody in this town or you know everybody um ice planet barbarians was really big in found family where it's like yeah look we're all stuck in this situation together let's be friends and make the best of it yeah and, yeah um I like that um, there's almost like an academy or a military aspect of when um, Aspeth goes to this um, this school, the basically mm -hmm. the Royal Artifactual Guild, and she's set up as a fledgling, which is mm -hmm. basically somebody that's um, in training to be an artificer with the mm -hmm. guild. And um, Anybody in that sort of situation, it's like, okay, this is your class. These are the people that you're going to be stuck with for the next while. You need to learn to live together. Yep. You need to learn to be friends. And it really does kind of um, bond you. I always love stories where like this scrappy group gets together and mm -hmm. uh, like they come out of it like super best friends. So mm -hmm. I love something like that. So I Me too. To it, so yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get it. And I think like the reason it's because I think, again, it goes back to like the misogyny and that kind of thing. It's relatable. Yes. You know, I think most people have been in a situation, whether it's in school, on a group project, whether it's work and it's some sort of like work group assignment kind of thing, or, you know, you're stuck going through, um, you know, even like, you know, I work like on committees and stuff in, in yeah. my town, like that kind of thing where you are sort of pieced together with people you would normally or choose to hang out with, you know, yeah. and it's just making the best of it. But I think the what's so great about in Bull Moon Rising is that, you know, these characters not only work together and get along and stuff like that. It's like they actually form these really deep bonds because of the hardships they go through in it, you know, about. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the characters that are in this little group that have to go through the training, you know, that aspect mm -hmm. is desperate to get into. Um, so are the other people. You know, everybody has their own reason for doing what they're doing. And the and they're all sort of rejects. And I think that them kind of working together towards that is it just bonds them close. And it's like, oh, yeah, I think, again, everybody can kind of relate to that as well. I mean, everybody feels like a reject at some point. If you don't, like, I need to pick your brain. because <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. Like, you, know, it's, um, you, you find your people and they might not mm -hmm. be the people you expect, but there's something to um appreciate and admire and that if somebody has your back you know i just i uh i like that sort of story because like real life can be really kind of lonely and shitty so yeah. you know having that that group of fast friends that like you know they'd help you bury the body <laughs> yeah for <laughs> sure 
extreme, you know? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and I loved all of the characters that are in group in an Aspis group. And um, and you know, obviously Hawk is the one leading them through this and teaching yeah. them and training them and everything. I, I loved each person for their own reasons, but I especially enjoyed Kip. He I was Kip. he yeah. was such an interesting character to me that I had no idea what to think of him when he's first introduced on the page. Because I just picture like this little frog man that's like walking on his two legs. Yeah. And he just looks like a little frog. Uh -huh. And he's just walking around like, but not saying anything. He doesn't speak. Right. And so I just thought like, what is happening? But <laughs> then like, as you, you progress through the book, you learn about, you know, how he does communicate and you learn through cues and stuff, which by the way, as a writer, that was really awesome. Like how you were <laughs> able to write that in there. I actually okay. stopped at one point and I was like this bitch, because I was so <laughs> impressed with how you were able to write him so like he was such a large character, you know, for him to be so tiny, but to have no speaking role. Yeah. For him to be like such a prominent character. Um, you know, and it was funny because I was like a lot of um uh, the, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase it. Like mm -hmm. one of the things that I wanted to put in this story was like there are more than just humans. Yes. Humans yes. Are, you know, we always think, oh, you know, we're number one, like kind of like America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. When you pull in these other races, I was like, well, okay, you have the Minotaur right? that's leading this. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Torians. How are they mm -hmm. perceived by the world? And we're going to have, I was like, you know, I want other races in there. And there's actually mm -hmm. like five races because five is the sacred number in the story. And then yes. you only run mm -hmm. into like three. And mm -hmm. there's like four if there's ratlings, which the ratlings are like, they have this whole long history behind them. They were cursed, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And then you also have like um, a missing race, which is like the Fae, which aren't really in this particular story. But it's like, it's mm -hmm. all part there. And I, so I had to think about like, wait, how are these all interacting together? And um, how would you react? Not everybody communicates the same, mm -hmm. you know, not yeah. everybody has the same customs. And so I thought about, well, what would that look like if you're interacting with someone? Um, and so I tried to make Kip different, but still like, it's, it's not a problem. It's just different. Yeah. So he's yeah. Talking to you, he's communicating with his gestures mm -hmm. because he is trying to, um, let you know what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, even though he doesn't have language. And I tried to make that clear that like, you know, it's not, it's not a problem. It's just a different way of communicating. And that's another thing that Aspeth has to figure out. It's like, oh, you mm -hmm. know, you can't shake everybody's hand because not everybody likes that. You can't, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, ask You're, The world that. isn't just your bubble. Right. Yeah. And I felt like I really wanted that to be present. And I will say that mm -hmm. Tate Kingfisher um, writes fantasy and she writes romantic fantasy and she has really great character building. She has like a race that's almost like a, a badger mm -hmm. and they talk very differently. They refer to themselves in the third person. And I believe mm -hmm. their, their gender roles are reversed. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting. It makes you think about like, okay, what does, you know, normal look mm -hmm. like for this other people that are completely mm -hmm. different from me? So I, uh, I thought yeah. that was fun to kind of explore. Yeah. And I felt like that theme was really throughout the book too. Like what is, what is truly other? Like what, and again, like, you know, the world isn't just from, the book is from, you know, from both Aspeth and Hawk's perspective, but it's not just what they see, you know, it's beyond that. We're so. talking this up way too much. It's a book about fucking y'all. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it Let's is, go, but go, I like, right? to, but that, that character in particular, and if you're listening to this and you go and read the book, you'll know if you come back and hear this, like this podcast episode again, you'll know exactly what I'm saying, how it was just like, it was such a, a he's such a tender character that just pulled at my heartstrings the whole time that I was like, I love Kip. And the fact that he has a little snail shell that he wears on his back, that's yeah. his house. I was like. That's fucking me. I just thought that was so cool. I, um, and it's, I initially was going to just have him be like a secondary character, just like kind of a walk on red shirt. Mm -hmm. And he just kept showing up in scenes. And I was mm -hmm. like, what would Kip think of this? And then, it was, you know, <laughs> he's just the cutest little man. 
Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And, and also content and like everybody else like sucked at everything. And he's like, <laughs> you know, like, I have to do this again and be successful again yeah. on my own. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just exhausted with everybody's idiocy, but nobody takes him serious because he's not a human, you know? Right. right. Yeah. So, um, and one of the other characters that I feel like was so much bigger on page than they are in stature was Squeaker. Yeah. And I absolutely adored her. And it's in the, it's at the, you know, in the author's notes at the end of the book. But please just let our lady listeners know how did you come up with Little Miss Squeaker? So Squeaker was a, um, is based off of my orange cat that I had for 17 years and Mm -hmm. she was a girl. She had a very big personality. Like she would, she would talk to you. If you said, Hey, Squeaky, how's your day? She'd be like, "Eh, eh," you know, like, like, you know, shit's happening. Like she Uh would talk to you and she had like a, a goofy little personality and she was a cat that shed like nothing I have ever seen before. Like you would just like walk past her and tufts would just like fly through the air mm-hmm. brush her twice a day. And it would still just be hair everywhere. Like, you know, when like Huskies blow their coats out. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that 24 seven. It was where you can like make a whole other cat with what comes <laughs> off. <of her. laughs> yeah. And she would just like lay on top of things. And I was like, um, she died a couple of years ago. She lived, she lived a very long life for a cat with mm-hmm. like severe asthma. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I started writing this, I was like, I'm going to give Aspa the cat. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to base it off of Squeaker. Cause like, mm-hmm. I still miss her. And so mm-hmm. it was a way to spend a little more time with her and I'm getting upset and I don't know why. No, so. <laughs> it's like, I just thought that was such a sweet way to honor your little baby. I just thought it was such a sweet thing to put in the book. Stop. I'm going to cry. Don't make me emotional. Well, it was, she was just such like a a big character on the, like, you know, just knowing her, like her through you and in her story and stuff and just getting to kind of like meet her in the book. I thought that was really awesome. So I thought it was really, it was a book about fucking (laughs) a book about fucking (laughs) his dick is huge. (laughs) You have no idea. Minotaur fucking, no. I know, right? Oh my God. So, you know, I think there, I think that's why, like, I would just enjoy the shit out of this book because oh, it's not, you. I mean, it is, it is about fucking, but it's not just about fucking. There's right, so right. much more that it, it's about, but I mean, it is about fucking. There's no, I'm fucking. overselling the fucking. There's not that much. No, listen, <laughs> I'm telling there's one scene. And if you don't want to know anything about the book, you've come too far. But <laughs> if, if you don't want to know anything about the fucking, it's not a spoiler, but there is a moment where they're watching other people fuck. And yes. let me tell you, holy shit, that was so fucking hot when I was reading that. I was like, damn, Rubes. Hmm. Look who brought her A game to the bull moon rising. Yeah, it's part of that, like, opening the eyes of the heroine to, like, you yeah, know, oh, the world around her. She was like, they're fornicating. I loved it when she said that. I felt, fell out. I was like, oh, this is great. I love, there's nothing I love more than a truly innocent heroine being exposed to something filthy. And right. then you're like, oh God, maybe I like it. <laughs> you know? Maybe not look, but look through my fingers, you know. And, sudden, so. and then I, all of a sudden I can't look away. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we're going to play for you. It's a 15 minute clip. Um, like I said it, uh, before, it's when Aspeth and Hawk, um, they they've already met and everything but this is a moment where they realize they can use each other where um aspeth can y- get married and use hawk as a sponsor to get into the guild so she can get into this program and hawk can be her teacher and hawk has um you know this broad idea that he can marry aspeth and use her for the conquest moon yeah. to get him through his heat cycle it's so. the negotiation mm-hmm. between them of what this is going to look like if they work together Yes. And then so like how they're going to how they're going to figure this out. So the audio um, they gave us an expert. It's used with permission from Penguin Random House audio from Bull Moon Rising by Ruby Dixon. It's read by Felicity Monroe and I believe it's Hero Diaz. Um, So is that how you say it? 
I genuinely don't know. I am sorry, Mr. <laughs> Diaz. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's uh, here. Felicity yeah. has done a lot of the Ice Planet Barbarian audio. Yes. So you mm-hmm. should be familiar with her work. Oh, and he was, oh my God, it's amazing because the, like I said, the clip you're about to hear, you start and it's Aspeth and she's talking to him. And then all of a sudden, like I had my headphones in when I was listening to the preview and then he comes on, Hop talks, and I was just like, fuck. Because it's just all of a sudden, it's like this deep rumbling, super sexy voice comes on. I was like, yes, yes. Okay. (laughs) So we're going to play that for you and we'll see you guys on the other side. Right. Thanks for having me on. Shut up. You're going to stay right here. Okay. You're not going anywhere. Just oh, okay. Shut okay. <laughs> Just shut up. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> Thank you so much, lady listeners. Wasn't that amazing? So I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Are you actually going to listen to it, though? No. No, I'm not no? going <laughs> to. <laughs> Will you listen to this podcast episode, do you think? Or no, you, no. 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 <laughs> Well, fuck I don't you. Want I have to, to listen to it for quality <laughs> control, so I have to listen to this shit again. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll just be like, we really talked for 27 minutes about cats. <laughs> I'm telling you, we could make a podcast. Writers and cats. Romance okay. writers and cats. See, you've already got the name. Set right. up the LLC. I'm in. Um, seriously though, thank you so much to, um, Penguin Random House Berkeley slash Berkeley for letting us play, um, an excerpt of Bull Moon Rising by Ruby Dixon. It is available today as of right now. You are listening to it. You can go get it, download the audio and the ebook, but fucking get that hardback. Cause I swear to God, if you have not seen it, go look. I think I even said on here when I was talking about it before in another episode, I was like, I saw the hardcover today and I shit myself. <laughs> I was like, literally, figuratively, however you want to say it. But it, I lost my shit when I saw it. It, gets it definitely stands out in a crowd. Oh, my God. I cannot wait to, like, walk down the aisle and just be like, whoop, there it is. <laughs> yeah, like across, across the store. Yeah. I can see it right now. <laughs> Bing. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with me. Thank you and, for having me. I love Read Me Romance. So. Well, I and love you. I love you. Oh, I, I love you. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll see you again in like at like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, lady listeners, um, you know what to do. If you need anything, check out on the show notes. We'll have links to all things Ruby Dixon down below on where to get it. And um, be sure to check us out. Um, up next week, come back. We have a brand new audio book. So that's it. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>